welcome to my series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today is one of India's most outspoken, original and incisive intellectuals and scholars. He's written extensively on subjects that range from the savage Freud to the Tao of cricket. He's published more than 200 papers and journals across the world. For 35 years, he's been a resident scholar at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies. He's often considered an outrageous intellectual. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Ashish Nandi. Outrageous intellectual, the Tao of cricket. It's a cricket series with Pakistan, and it's circumscribed by so much recent writing you've done uh, that's looking at issues of South Asian identity, that's looking at issues of secularism, of partition. Let's start with, with, with cricket. Uh, this whole sort of uh, coming together of Punjabiyat, of, of, of the meeting between uh, Indian and, 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 and Pakistani cricketers, cricket fans, uh, uh, a, a new kind of synergy. What do you make of this? It's a very happy sign and I would think that this might lead to something more substantive. Uh, in fact, I would also like to point out that I do not think the relationship between India and Pakistan is ever going to be smooth. The reason for that is this, that Pakistan is not only a country, it is a country which partly stays within us. Everybody has his or her own Pakistan. And this Pakistan inside us is what we are fighting. And Pakistan is similarly, are constantly fighting an India which is within them. That makes it a difficult relationship. You know, uh, this is almost sort of the, the language of the clinical psychologist that you are, of, you know, of, 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 of a contradictory impulse in some senses that is within us. I mean, I'm not even sure that's contradictory, but another impulse that, that coexists uh, within us. I, as a layperson, one would imagine that if we have in India elements of Pakistan within us and, and, and people in Pakistan have elements of India within us, I mean, within them, what, what, what better formula for, for harmony and, 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 and coexistence? On the contrary, <laughs> um, uh, these days I am studying genocides and some of the worst genocides of our time uh, have taken place. In fact, you can say this is the iron law of genocides. I would propose it as an iron law of genocide, that the worst genocides always involve two parties who are very close to each other. When that closeness snaps, strange demons are released and it becomes very difficult to control or even contain in any way the venom that is released. Mm -hmm. Well, let's apply this to, to your sort of, you know, your, your, your philosophy and interpretations of, of, of cricket and, and, and the cricket field. Uh, that's what we're in the midst of right now. How do you see this unfolding through cricket? I mean, it, you know, what is that special relationship to, to, to the nuances, the magic, the spirit of cricket uh, and, and, and what is happening? Well, uh, <laughs> I, I think the primary attraction of cricket globally, and I'm not talking of South Asia. South Asia, there are other specific reasons why cricket is so popular. But the primary reason cricket is globally popular is this, that unlike many other sports, cricket is actually a projective test. It tells you more about what you are what you read into the game, then about the game itself. Uh, cricket, uh, in fact, makes uh, one billion Indian specialists in cricket. Everybody talks of cricket as if he or she is a specialist on it. They have suggestions about team selection, about style of play, strategy, so on and so forth. In fact, cricket reveals what you are. Nothing much happens on the field. It is a slow-moving game. Uh, and apparently it's a game which is not exciting but it is exciting by virtue of being a game that reveals your character because you do not have much to do because most of the time you define what is going to happen in some sense you reveal yourself mm -hmm. and that's the attraction of cricket no, you've also written and talked about uh, how there is a, a, in a sense, a unified South Asian identity. Um, and there really aren't sort of that many local identities. There are local identities, all right. 
but there is also a kind of South Asian identity which we call South Asia out of politeness because it looks otherwise arrogant. Uh, this is basically an Indian identity. Indian identity, as identity said, yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, if, if you like, not to call it Indian, we can call it Hindustani because that was what was the land known as originally or Al Hind or Bharat that or Jambudi. That's in a sense more provocative. You bring in Hindu Stani instead of. But in, uh, I find that in Pakistan, everybody calls it Hindustan, and uh, often they call it. Uh, mm, uh, in, uh, often some of them call uh, uh, India, India, but by Hindustan they allude to British India. So, I mean, uh, at the end of the Mughal times, I guess Al Hind or Hindustan has made a certain space for itself. But if you can call it Jambudip for all I care, mm -hmm. but that <laughs> it doesn't change. <laughs> yeah, but tell us about this, 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 this identity. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. That entity allowed a certain kind of an interplay of different civilizations, cultures, so on and so forth. And their regional identities are important, but they are important also to the extent they are in dialogue with each other. So they are not isolated cultures. And even if you take the various faiths of South Asia, I think none of the faiths can be considered complete without reference to the other faith. If you are a student of religion, you cannot really study one of the religious systems in isolation from the other ones. There have been this constant dialogue, give and take. And it is that dialogue, that open-ended nature um, of the dialogue and the way this part of the world provides a forum where different civilizations interact and change themselves. They are not changed by others as much as they change themselves in uh, conversation with others that makes it a very interesting enterprise. Mm -hmm. That's what uh, the civilization is all about. Mm -hmm. You're watching a conversation with Ashish Nandi, clinical psychologist by training, sociologist and intellectual. I'll be right back after a short break. Don't go away. <laughs> Welcome back to a continuing conversation with Ashish Nandi. Uh, you know, you were talking about uh, the, you know, the interplay between different fates in, 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 in South Asia. Uh, you have written very emphatically and, and, and somewhat controversially uh, on, on, on your understanding of secularism uh, and, and, and how that, that runs counter to the established notions of secularism as practiced by the state. Yes, I'm not a secularist. I might as well own this up. Um, I, I say so because I think the concept is flawed both in its basic assumptions as well as in his ca capability to deliver the goods. Mm -hmm. This is a concept which is <coughs> which is uh, seen to be the ultimate guarantor of our humanness, whereas I think this part of the world has learned to live with differences, particularly religious differences over centuries. Mm -hmm. It has done without secularism and done very well without it. If you have to invo in invoke a concept, if you want to coin something to cover that part of the story, we should have borrowed from our languages, our lifestyles and our experiences. Mm -hmm. I mean, all the great secularists who, who are routinely, in fact, ritually invoked mm -hmm. in any debate on the subject, except for one, Jawaharlal Nehru, mm -hmm. none of them had even heard the word secularism and could do perfectly well without it, whether it's Akbar or Ashoka um, or Guru Nanak or what have you. Um, in fact, I think in the heart of hearts, everybody knows it. You know, you started by calling me an outrageous uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, intellectual. Uh, my work or my thought had seemed outrageous exactly when I am saying something which everybody knows in the heart of hearts, but is afraid of owning up. Um, everybody knows that the concept of secularism has not taken us far. Everybody knows that the record of village India today is far superior to that of urban India. On, in the last 50 years, only 3.5% of those who have died in communal riots have died in villages. 96.5% have died in cities. And mind you, 3 fourth of our people stay in villages. And uh, our Eight or ten major cities account for uh, more than two thirds of the riots. Mm -hmm. So it is not that ordinary Indians have to be given lessons in religious tolerance. They know how to live with each other. Um, 
it is we who need to learn something from them. Mm -hmm. uh, we are uh, unwilling and nervous mm -hmm. about acknowledging that fact. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you, you, we are afraid that in a world where we don't use the concept of secularism but concepts mm -hmm. derived mm -hmm. from the worldview practices. So what is the political structure? How would you change the way the state approaches and relates the to religion? states are always by definition secular. Even Gandhi, who said that those who say that religion has nothing to do with politics and politics nothing to do with religion, understand neither religion nor politics. They cannot be kept separate. Uh, but on the other hand, he also said the state had to be secular. The state had to be secular at that time, perhaps he said it, probably it made some sense. I do not think it makes much sense today because states are definitionally secular. Even states which claim to be inspired by religious ideologies, which are, uh, say for example, Islamic state or Hindu state uh, like Iran or Nepal are. Even in these states, if you look at the nature of statecraft, then you will find that it is perfectly secular. But what when sort of uh, the state, as you know, happened in Gujarat, uh, is, is certainly seen to be an instigator of conflict, an instigator of tolerance, yeah. an instigator of, of what, what we have uh, uh, you know, prided ourselves uh, in a sense of, of this diversity tolerance and then the state comes in and appears to move counter to that strand. Yes, if you look at the uh, last 50 years of records on riots and a um, lot of investigations, I have done some investigations of a number of riots, but uh, uh, people like Asghar Ali Engineer have done fantastic work in this area over the last 30 years or so. If you look at this data, you will find that almost all cases, the riots cannot just take place without some complicity of the state and the law enforcement machinery of the state. In fact, I have the feeling that um, any riot can be stopped um, by the state if it has the will to do so. And if it lasts more than two hours, uh, it means there is complicity of state machinery in the riot. In fact, it would be a nice um, uh, constitutional innovation if any government which cannot control a light within something like say four hours, you give a grace period of two hours or maybe six hours, mm -hmm. uh, cannot stop a riot, then that government must be immediately dismissed. Mm -hmm. How do you reconcile this notion of, uh, uh, you know, that, that the state is inherently secular, um, you know, no matter what its sort of dominant ideology, and yet in its functioning, um, is, is frequently a, a sort of a provocateur of, of, of a violence of what appear to be contrary to the very principles that you say uh, define it. That's because the nature of rights have changed over the last 50 years. Most rights now are perfectly secular. I mean, they are uh, organized and perpetrated the way a expert strategist thinks of a political ploy. I mean, they, are, uh, they calculate the co uh, cost and benefits of each riot, um, the way a chartered accountant you know, uh, I'm works. L I'm lost and confused. You'll have to, you'll have to give, sort of e explain, say, what happened in Gujarat as, as a secular I riot mean, in it, the it, manner it, that you describe it. Everybody knows this, that the Gujarat riots were organized because it, paid, it was expected to pay excellent dividend in the forthcoming elections. In fact, there, even in Gujarat, there, were, uh, there, were, there was hardly any rioting in uh, Saurashtra and South Gujarat because these two areas uh, were uh, the bastion of the BJP. BJP was more unsure of itself in Central Gujarat and North Gujarat. The riots took place exactly in Central Gujarat and North Gujarat. Every riot takes place on, on because somebody has calculated that it will pay political dividends. Mm -hmm. So the person who is organizing the riot is not an impassioned Hindu. Mm -hmm. He is not a defender of faith. Nobody uh, calculates that way. The riot is organized because it is likely to give political dividends. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I know of cases where riots have been instigated in collaboration with somebody in the other community because it will pay you political dividends. You are uh, contact somebody from the other side, in some uh, anti-social elements mm -hmm. who uh, in league with you precipitate a uh, small crisis or a small riot, mm -hmm. and uh, that pays you some. But dividend. these have but these have consequences 
for the secular fabric of India in terms of the way people experience uh, conflict, uh, experience or perceive uh, you know what what you call uh, a secular riot as, as really being an attack upon their faith it, it, it leads to to minorities very in some few people do it I think the, there is a uh, small number of people who think that uh, religion is a danger or has to be defended most people know that it's organized by uh, criminals and politicians mm -hmm. and that it has nothing to do with faith in fact you will be surprised uh, by the extent to which uh, often communities maintain links with each other mm -hmm. uh, despite rioting because they know riots mm -hmm. uh, have been organized mm -hmm. uh, for a particular purpose in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, there are exceptions. I think the partition riots which I am mm -hmm. studying at the moment was an exception. It did spread to villages. There was a lot of passions involved. There were also people who profited from it but it also involved a lot of emotional baggage. Mm -hmm. uh, and the last Gujarat riot uh, um, uh, reinvoked the memories of partition riots in many, including me, uh, because here a uh, lot of hatred was spewed. Uh, but in most cases, uh, this is not fully true. Even if the riot is a very widespread bar, like the anti Sikh riots in Delhi. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I have seen the way the riots were used mm -hmm. by people from the slums mm -hmm. to get access to color TVs, mm -hmm. two in ones, mm -hmm. uh, and cordless telephones. Mm -hmm. So, a riot uh, give the slum dwellers ch his chance once in eight or ten years. Mm -hmm to get things which they couldn't otherwise dream of getting. You're watching a conversation with Professor Ashish Dandi. We'll be right back after a short break. Don't go away. <music> Welcome back to a continuing conversation with Professor Ashish Nandi. You have written so extensively on so many subjects. You know, when I was going through the list of your publications, you know, is Ray Indian, and I had mentioned, you know, Thou of Cricket, across the board. What is your strongest personal passion that, 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 that interests you and drives you? Or does it sort of keep varying sort of over the 35 you know, odd years, 40 years that you have been writing? If you read in between lines <laughs> of my writings, mm -hmm. I think it, they will not leave you um, in any doubt that my concern is actually very narrow. I am interested in what makes a human being tick. What works in the mind, what, what a person is like, what a human being is like, what is it to be a human in this part of the world. Um, and it is that passion, that attempt to understand human nature, um, which has uh, driven me into different areas. Uh, not because I am interested in the areas per se, but I want to see how human beings work under different conditions. I have oscillated between these two very uh, big interests which have always been with me one human potentialities and human destructiveness mm -hmm. and um, so when I work on human potentialities I have gone into subjects like scientific creativity mm -hmm. or um, the art of cinema mm -hmm. or what cinema tells you mm -hmm. and when I am interested in human destructiveness I have gone into subjects like uh, genocide and secularism and things like that. Well, you know, we're here recording this for television, uh, for a public broadcasting channel. How do you see the impact of globalized television unfolding and, 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 what, and, and, and in what ways is it likely to affect uh, Indian society? You know, it, it beyond the rhetoric, you know, we've heard of how it's going to, you know, sort of uh, talk about uh, uh, increasing consumerism, increasing our sensibilities to, uh, uh, to, to need and greed. You know, there is the popular rhetoric. But in, in, in what fundamental changes, enduring changes, uh, do you feel that it's going to make on, on our society? First of all, I want to make very clear that I think a culture or a civilization which collapses because 50 new ch television channels start is, uh, uh, is a culture which deserves to die. Um, <laughs> I think <laughs> we have a uh, culture which is made of sterner stuff. Mm -hmm. It won't die that easily. So I'm not worried out about that part of the story. What bothers me is this that television 
is basically a total media. It's a media which uh, involves all your sense perceptions. It is visual, it is auditory, and uh, it it tries to capture you, uh, capture all of you, in the sense that you are reduced to being a passive receiver of messages. Mm -hmm. In novel, when you read a novel, mm -hmm. you don't have any visual cues. You imagine mm -hmm. how the characters are. You imagine what the landscape is like. And that act of imagination makes it a bit of a conversation. Mm -hmm. You are not a passive receiver of messages only. Mm -hmm. When you listen to a radio play, mm -hmm. yes, you at least visualize mm -hmm. something. I think the newer media, cinema and television, are much more total and my suspicion is this that this on the one hand opens up an enormous amount of creativity and there are a lot of potentialities in this media but on the other hand it reduces you, you, you spectators and I am more worried about the fact that um, this attitude will percolate into our politics also. So this idea which you see in operation in much of uh, West Europe and North America that every citizen mm -hmm. is basically a passive spectator who sees politics on his tel or her television mm -hmm. for five years and after five years uh, about say one third of them go out and vote mm -hmm. and they think they have done their duty mm -hmm. once they have written um, a angry letter to the editor or picked up the telephone and called that um, an interactive uh, anchor mm -hmm. on the television screen. Mm -hmm. They have done their duty. And it is that passivity I fear. Mm -hmm. I am deeply interested uh, in uh, the culture of democracy mm -hmm. and citizenship. And I think that uh, we have a certain distrust of our citizens. We call them citizens, but we are uncomfortable if they act like citizens. This fear was always there in democratic theory. This is the underside of democratic theory, has been so for the last 200 years. Even if you, in writings of people like John Stuart Mill, you see reflections of this fear, that you want to give democratic rights to people, but you are afraid what they will do with the rights. You are constantly uh, fearful that these savages, semi-literate, <laughs> <laughs> ill-motivated uh, persons whom we call citizens will exercise their own concepts of what is politics, what is right, what is wrong and we will have to live with it. So the entire attempt is to develop a language of politics which will make them feel half-baked, which make them feel like apprentice citizens or student citizens. And here we are, the mature, proper citizens, guiding them towards the better future. Uh, my objection to secularism is that, though people think it is primarily cultural, it's not cultural, mm -hmm. it is democratic. Mm -hmm. Talking about the media, there is this element of the democratization of media, the democratization of the public's access, that when you're looking at things like the electronic media, when you're looking at contemporary television uh, with, uh, you know, cross-media holdings, with globalized television where uh, an entity in the United States or in the United Kingdom or wherever can begin to regulate or, or control the content that you and I see, the notion of democracy, you know, of, 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 of this sort of, of, of the town hall where mm. opinions are articulated uh, has disappeared. The community doesn't really have access to the electronic media. So you aren't, you, right. aren't you fearful that uh, uh, over a period of time, as an extension of the very point that you made, that, that not only are we sort of passively sitting and, and, and receiving messages, but we can't have access to that media if, if, if we wanted to. You know, the, 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 you know the, the, the old romantic notion that if you had something to say, you, you know, wrote something and cyclostyled it and distributed it or, or whatever, mm. uh, as you mm. went back in time, has completely yes. been lost. Isn't that in some ways the greatest threat to democracy or a greater yes. threat to democracy? <laughs> Perhaps you have a point there. I, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to consider that. In fact, I think you are, you are, this is a very serious point you are making. And I do think that one of the reasons there is so much of competition to control the audiovisual media is 
partly because unlike the older media, this cyclo style machines and uh, pamphlets being distributed at street corners, uh, this me uh, media uh, has a tendency to uh, um, uh, tendency to give a enormous reach to a few people and any control of it uh, uh, ensures a certain kind of political advantage mm -hmm. straight away. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, in the United States, many people have already started saying that the only difference between Vietnam mm -hmm. and Iraq war is this, mm -hmm. that in Vietnam they did not know how to control the media, mm -hmm. now they know it. Mm -hmm. What about you, Ashish Nandi, as an individual? You have been writing with passion and intellectual rigor for decades and on so many uh, social issues uh, that are crying for change. Um, at, at the micro level, do you still have sort of the faith that individuals uh, such as yourself uh, uh, or what kind of individuals would be able to catalyze real change in the directions that, that you're pointing to? Ultimately, thought does percolate through. I mean, you might not uh, directly see the results of it. You may not live to see it. But I think, in some sense, you plant uh, saboteurs mm -hmm. in every family and household. Your works are uh, studied by students. The next generation of students uh, are not what this generation of students are, they bring in a different kind of consciousness, even when their teachers advise them not to read uh, people with uh, strange ideas like mine. Uh, they, uh, they read it more, I guess, because of that, uh, um, 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 that guidance, I guess. Um, and in the long run, ideas are not lost. They have a force of their own and they do seep through the public consciousness. It takes time, but it does. Well, I think it's, you know, for me, it's really significant that just when I was expecting you to say, plant the seeds of, you said plant saboteurs. I think that is sort of the, uh, the truly revealing of why you as a writer make us uh, so often sit up and think, uh, you know, to, to take notice of what you're writing and be challenged by it. Thank you very much for this great privilege of talking to you. Thank you.